Good evening. Welcome to Vibrant Hong Kong. I'm Rico. And I'm Mishi. Good evening, everyone. Mishi, what are your thoughts on Hong Kong's economic environment? Well, with the economy gradually recovering after the pandemic, we're starting to see signs of growth. As the city embarks on the pursuit of high-quality development, I think the future will be filled with both opportunities and challenges. Hong Kong is a small, fully open and free economy. Its close connection with the external environment means that it's easily affected by macro factors. And this is especially significant in an age where Asia and the Middle East are on the rise. Asia's economy is expected to expand by about 4.6% this year, which isn't only higher than the global average, but also accounts for two-thirds of all global growth. It's expected that the region will continue to grow at a high rate next year and become a global economic powerhouse in the future. As an international financial center, Hong Kong must keep up with the times to maintain its edge. One way of doing so is to develop the city into an INT hub to drive economic transformation. To this end, the Science and Technology Innovation Prize was launched last year. With the aim of promoting local INT development, it rewards scientists and research teams who have contributed to the advancement of the respective disciplines as well as the transformation of scientific and technological achievements in Hong Kong. Let's take a look at the accomplishments of this year's laureates. 我衷心祝贺各位得奖者，并且寄望各个科研团队继续卓丽奋发，逐创佳绩。Now in its second year, the BOCHK Science and Technology Innovation Prize aims to honor scientists and research teams for their notable contributions to scientific and technological innovation and transformation in Hong Kong. Which will facilitate the city's emergence as a significant INT hub. I think uh, events such as this tip is basically can be used to showcase to the world and also to our young people in particular of the achievements of science and technology locally, and and then by this showcasing, of course, this will achieve a number of very positive impact. For example, could help to attract. Uh, more talents to Hong Kong could attract our best students to consider science and technology as their future careers. Uh, could attract investment into Hong Kong. The STIP focuses on five key fields, aligning with the nine strategic emerging industries proposed in the nation's 14th five-year plan, and the initiatives prioritized by the Hong Kong SAR government. The laureates for this year are as follows. In artificial intelligence and robotics, Professor Jia Jia Ya. In life and health, Dr. Ellen Wong. In new materials and new energy, Dr. Tang Jin Yao. In advanced manufacturing, Professor Benny Cheng. And in fintech, Professor Ellen Ao and Professor Daniel Luo. Among these fields. Artificial intelligence and robotics stands out as a hot topic that is continuously evolving and experiencing dynamic changes. Let's explore the latest innovations spearheaded by the laureate in this domain. When I first became a, a assistant professor in 2004, I, am, I was doing uh, some kind of a research of computer vision. Computer vision is trying to equip the machines with some eyes like a human, so that machines can do exactly the same complicated tasks like human. So 10 years ago, I began to work on some projects about using the machine learning method to um, beautify our photos. And then we realized that if I can make the phone smarter and smarter. The camera uh, needs to be complicated enough so that a camera can do a lot of tasks like today. So we begin to think, if what if I uh, equip this kind of eyes into the machines in, in the factory? So for manufacturing, the goal is to make all the machines in the factory smarter and uh, uh, no people operating. Today, uh, I brought some kind of smart sensor. So this sensor is actually the eyes of machines, like the eyes of human. This is the lens and eyes. They input onto the production line and then monitor the all happening things in the factory. They know exactly every moment 
what is going on in factory during the uh, manufacturing process. And this has become the trend of the whole world evolving into next stage. So we call this Industry 4.0. The STIP serves as a catalyst for researchers to achieve global prominence, drive economic development, and improve people's livelihoods as a whole. So, what other key actions can be taken to foster a sustainable INT ecosystem? Hong Kong is uh, actually quite good in original research. So, having original research is very important. Now you see all these translational activities that we are really harvesting. Um, or reaping the harvest is really coming from all the original research that originates uh, probably like 15, 20 years ago. And I think this is really golden time because now the Hong Kong SAR government as well as the nation is really investing into science and technology development. So I encourage all the young people who are really interested in science to really join us to build a stronger science and technology hub, and particularly with Hong Kong connecting to the rest of the world, serving as the international center for innovation and working together with everyone in the Greater Bay Area as well as the rest of the nation, as well as the rest of the world to build a better future. Hong Kong's economy continued to recover in the third quarter of 2023, with the real GDP growing by 4.1% year-on-year. Nonetheless, the future is still filled with uncertainties and challenges. Established over 160 years ago, the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce has always been an important voice representing the local business sector. Tonight, we've invited a CEO, Mr. Patrick Yun, to share the Chamber's views on Hong Kong's economy. Welcome. Thank you, Rico. Mr. Yun, you were appointed CEO of the HKGCC in May this year. Um, what do you hope to achieve during your term, and what is your plan for helping the Chamber to develop further? Well, despite my appointment at the end of May, I actually only first started uh, at the Chamber on the 1st of August. Um, the chamber is the oldest established in Hong Kong, over 160 years, obviously. We are the voice of business. The economy have changed or will change, but uh, our uh, really focus on being the voice of business will continue to uh, remain unchanged. And more importantly, uh, Hong Kong is the, the international the positioning and branding. And I think my chamber, uh, which is very international, with more than 17% of multinational corporations as our members, is truly an international chamber. And I hope continually we're going to build on the international image and the international connections of our chamber supporting Hong Kong's uh, international position. I hope uh, our chamber will also be rhymed uh, with the same uh, flow, uh, in particular when we are so-called the mini asset of the Hong Kong uh, business world, where our members, uh, over 3,000, are actually the representing big corporations and SMEs. So with this new direction, I hope that uh, our chambers will rhyme with this uh, new economic development and focusing more, for example, the development of uh, business uh, ties with GBA and also looking a bit more forward and how ESG is going to be the part of uh, the important journey that our chamber will uh, take forward together with our members. Hong Kong has been suffering, in particular uh, from outbound trade. We are very excited that uh, Hong Kong finally uh, uplifted all the the pandemic uh, restrictions. And then we all look forward uh, in March uh, a very vibrant uh, economic recovery. So I'm sure there are still a lot of uncertainties for the future years. But following up on that, what is your forecast for 2024? Will it be a year filled with challenges or opportunities? Well, challenges and opportunities are always uh, two sides of the coin. Uh, looking at what's happening around the world now, the uh, geopolitical situation is still very tense, and then there are a lot of complexities in the, uh, the world relationships among countries, uh, interest rates still remain high, and uh, the world um, economic growth uh, seems to be a bit sluggish uh, as projected from, uh, from now, uh, seeing what's happening. So I, I think uh, the Hong Kong's uh, growth will be impacted 
in 2024 by all these uh, uncertainties and also the, the challenges ahead. Uh, it probably will be a slower growth in 2023, uh, but in the recent the business prospect survey that we did with our members, uh, we've seen some of the more cautiously optimistic sentiments among our members. Uh, about 37% of our members think that they probably will be the, having revenue increase uh, over 2023, uh, looking into next year. Um, but uh, the overall growth, uh, uh, we projected it will be slower than this year. In your opinion, does the local business sector want to explore more collaborations or initiatives with the government? I think during such difficult times and during COVID time, the government have uh, put up a lot of uh, aids and subsidies to help uh, the economy. I think the government should try the best uh, to see the which really the segment in the business that they really need to give them some support, uh, at least in the short run, to bridge them over so that uh, the development could be back to normal before long. Mm -hmm, I see. I understand that the Chamber has put a lot of effort into giving its overseas connections an accurate account of the latest situation in Hong Kong. So what has the Chamber done on this front this year? Uh, we uh, have uh, missions uh, always to the build up uh, business ties and since the opening up of Hong Kong uh, since March, uh, our uh, Chamber's uh, mission activities have included to the Saudi Arabia, to United Arab uh, uh, Middle East and also to ASEAN and uh, more recently uh, in the November uh, just last month uh, we have a mission delegation to Vietnam to Beijing and also to uh, Osaka Yasaki area in Japan so the business missions uh, have always been the, the key event activities uh, of our of our chamber I see. Now, I want to know, do you think the geopolitical tensions in recent years have affected Hong Kong's trade and economy? Obviously, the, the, the U.S. Uh, Sino the tension, geopolitical and other parts of the world, have uh, affected Hong Kong, uh, and no doubt, uh, also the supply chain. Um, but Hong Kong has always been very resilient uh, in, in this. Uh, on very limbo in this uh, economy uh, in addressing all these challenges. Uh, I mentioned about the missions that, that we have uh, in uh, really building up international connections and find uh, new business markets for our members. Uh, just uh, recently, the, um, the, the uh, trip that we'd make to Beijing, our uh, the mission, uh, the very high delegation, and we have managed to uh, meet up with uh, the director Xia uh, uh, of uh, the Hong Kong Macau office. Mm -hmm. And what we the uh, reinforcing the, the positive message to us, Hong Kong's importance is in its uh, professional services, financial, our talents, and all these are what Hong Kong can contribute and help uh, to build up uh, the Hong Kong value uh, to the international uh, business uh, community then allowing them to, to make investment here. So you earlier mentioned about the meeting with Xia Baolong. Mm -hmm. May I also ask, aside from the Hong Kong Chamber, what other international chambers from Hong Kong have accompanied to this trip? For this particular trip, uh, my mission to Beijing, we actually got uh, the Germans, the British, the Italians, the Spanish, Canadian, and also the European the Chamber of Chambers representative to join us. And uh, they all have the opportunities uh, to speak with uh, uh, Director Xia directly. Even though originally it is only planned for the one representative, international representative to speak, but it ended up that all uh, the international representatives uh, on an unscripted basis, a very frank dialogue with uh, Director Xia and uh, which again uh, reconfirming the importance of uh, the international community and how Hong Kong uh, continues to be played up uh, to this international uh, positioning and uh, the, the real task that uh, mm -hmm. we can really help to build uh, to support uh, the, the mainland uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. That's really good to hear. Now, Hong Kong aims to develop into an international INT center, which will require talent as well as a vast workforce. So what is the current labor situation in Hong Kong? We definitely need uh, talents in all that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, our government uh, also understand, realize that uh, the importance of that to build up the capability 
so that all these uh, international important sentence activities that Hong Kong is tasked to perform will be able to deliver the results uh, as expected. But our government has been very pragmatic. Uh, uh, we have various schemes, including the, the talent trial, the top talent pass, and the various uh, the labor, the imported schemes uh, to allow, at least in the short run, uh, we'll be able to uh, get uh, more of these uh, talents to join us. Now, regarding the shortage of skilled workers, the Chamber has conducted a survey in which companies expressed that they were willing to offer better salary packages and also invest in employee development. Do you think Hong Kong is still an attractive place for seeking career opportunities? Our chamber is actually one of uh, the recipients of uh, excellent employer by ah. MPF. <laughs> Even great. though our size is not uh, as big as many others. Uh, I think uh, attracting talents uh, is obviously one thing. Uh, I mentioned a couple of the policies that the government had initiated uh, and then uh, by providing uh, good opportunities for them. Uh, but I think from the other angle of looking at this, uh, we also need to look at uh, what our homegrown. Uh, we got a really fantastic, uh, we got eight universities. We continue to nourish and nurture uh, future leaders. Do you think that Hong Kong is still a highly competitive international city? And what do we need to do to keep ahead of the game? Hong Kong has a lot of all these um, advantages that uh, no other city in the world have. Uh, our geographic locations, uh, within three hours flight, it will cover 70 to 75 percent of the world populations. The infrastructure that we have built uh, over that many years uh, give us uh, one of the most efficient uh, cities, uh, in particular our public transportation. And then uh, our connections uh, with all these new infrastructure uh, by road, by air, by sea, with GBA, which is uh, a really the important economic uh, region in years to come, uh, plus all the other things of uh, that being uh, provided for under one country system, or the, the very simple, easy tax system, and a friendly, very friendly business environment, and the internationalism of Hong Kong. I think all these uh, we just need to keep on uh, not losing sight of that. Uh, be optimistic, uh, riding on using the Hong Kong strength uh, being a very successful financial the international hub, our strengths in the, the financial capability, uh, plus uh, the focus on innovation and technology. With that, we could uh, invite more international investors to come here and uh, build up um, the, the business for the future. Mm -hmm. We definitely look forward to more great news to come in the coming years. Now, thank you, Mr. Yuan, so much for sharing your expert insights with us. And we hope that Hong Kong will continue to have greater growth in the coming years. Now, in addition to being an international financial center, Hong Kong also values the arts. A local university has joined forces with several Asian institutions to set up an award to recognize and honor the outstanding achievements of recent arts graduates in Hong Kong and Asia motivating them to pursue excellence in their creative practices, both locally and internationally. Now here are some highlights from the award ceremony. The university is a place where creativity and tomorrow's talents are nurtured. As an art graduate myself, I cherished every opportunity to learn and practice. Co-organized by the Hong Kong Baptist University's Academy of Visual Arts and other art institutions, Art Futures, Outstanding Graduates Awards in Asia is dedicated to the cultivation of exceptional emerging artists. The nominees for the first edition of the awards come from over 70 art colleges and institutions across Asia. The judges were tasked with selecting six finalists from a wide range of disciplines, including painting, sculpture, media art and performing arts. The works by the shortlisted artists will be showcased in an exhibition at HKBU's Kai Tuck campus. Additionally, I would also like to thank the participating artists for their passion and creativity uh, in their submissions, a selection of which we have the pleasure of viewing tonight. Finally, I invite every one of you to immerse yourself in the beauty and diversity of the artworks that we're seeing here. Elena Yoshimura, congratulations, Elena. The winner of the first prize is Irina Yoshimura from Japan. In addition to receiving a 10,000 US dollar cash award, 
she will also be offered a one-month artist residency in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the second prize has been jointly awarded to Xiong Jun from Sichuan and Cleo Lao Jin Ki from Hong Kong. Hello Cleo, thank you for having the interview with us. So how are you feeling right now? I'm honored to be among the top six and I'm grateful to have the uh, conversation with other participants from other countries. Um, we have exchanged a lot uh, uh, regarding our creative processes. So this work is created through three different um, uh, medium, pre-making, ceramics and photography. So these images are actually come from the daily photos of, uh, that I took in my daily life. And then I make them into a silk screen and then I print it uh, with uh, clay slips. When clay is a three-dimensional material, that two-dimensional images transform into three-dimensional scape like this. So after the shortlist was, were announced, I saw many other participants um, work. I think it's a really good platform to let us get to know other artists' uh, creative processes. The members of this year's international judging panel are all Art World heavyweights. They include Japanese artist Yoshitomo Nara, as well as Chinese critique and curator Han Ru Ho. Hello Mr. Hao, thank you for having the interview with us. What do you think about the standards of works from different parts of Asia? In each cultural context, each um, place across Asia, they have different kind of questions about mm -hmm. art. It's really important the artist can provide us an alternative understanding and vision about the standards and break it. We end up you know, choosing this finalist and then uh, really trying to understand how they provide something that we don't see in the usual way. So if there is a standard, the standard is about against the standard. What quality should uh, you know young and new emerging artists should have? Very simple. They do things that we cannot do anymore. <laughs> yeah, to break through, right? I think so. Hopefully. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Hao. Mishi, you look a bit tired. Are you feeling okay? Well, it's really sweet of you to ask, Rico. I'm fine, but I guess I could use a break because this month has been quite hectic. With many migratory birds visiting Hong Kong in winter, bird watching seems like a good way to slow down and enjoy life. And the great thing about it is that you don't necessarily have to go to the countryside to do so. There are actually many birds that are fascinating to learn about even in the heart of the city. All we need to do is take the time and observe carefully. Let's find out how we can live the slow life by becoming urban bird watchers. Hong Kongers lead such a fast-paced life that we often overlook the things around us. Birds are one such example. Did you know that they also live in the city and are closely related to our daily lives? Samson, thank you for taking us bird watching today. Most people associate bird watching with going to my po, but turns out it's something that we can do in our parks too. So, what's unique about urban bird watching? Well, because there are many different parks in Hong Kong, and some of them may be very close to your working place or very near your home. So, you can do urban birding at your own pace. You don't have to travel far. Uh, most of the parks, they have very good uh, communication system that you can take public transportation or there may be uh, car parks nearby. So uh, I, I truly encourage family uh, to do some birding at weekend. Let's take Ma On Shan Park as an example. What are the most commonly found bird species here? Ma On Shan Park, uh, like many other parks, um, 
Tree sparrows may be one of the stars uh, to be found in Mount Shan Park. Most people will associate the uh, sparrow as a very common bird. But if we take really closer look um, at those birds, those sparrows, um, we see colors. They are not just brown. They are many different colors. They have their legs, their feet, they are uh, pinkish, and they have very uh, the diverse uh, brown and white and dark patches on the body. And they're not indeed that common, because if you go to countryside, um, tree sparrows will usually uh, associate with people. They live close to urban area. So uh, we do not take them for granted. If we travel far away from urban parks, um, tree sparrow becomes very difficult to be seen. So the next time I see tree sparrows, I'll be sure to look, take a better look at them. Yes. If you listen closely, you'll find that every bird species has a different call. Eurasian tree sparrows are birds that we see on a daily basis. Samson can tell that they're fighting just from the sounds they make. Some rarer species can be spotted at Kowloon Park. Let's follow Samson and see what we'll find. Here in Kowloon Park, surrounded by skyscrapers, and you can find an island, a green island. So that's what makes uh, Kowloon Park so special. You have trees, you have water, and you can find many different kinds of birds here, including some of the most colorful, like kingfishers, like uh, minifets, blue magpies, etc. And it's so special that uh, it's, it doesn't take you too long uh, to get to here. You can get um, um, public transportation from everywhere. Even tourists who spend maybe half, half day here uh, to, to relax during the business trip. Urban bird watching is not just an activity for citizens, but travelers from around the world. We met Tara, a traveler from Norway, who also happened to be bird watching. Look at how bird watching is bringing people from all over the world together. Hi, Tara. So you came all the way from Norway. Did you expect to see so many birds in the cityscape? Well, I did not know what I was going to see. I was hoping to see some birds. Uh, and uh, I'm very lucky because I already saw quite a few species here in the park. And I hope to see a lot of more. It's surprising to learn that there are so many places in Hong Kong where we can birdwatch. Sometimes it can be quite relaxing just sitting in a park and observing nature up close. Mishi, if you want to feel even closer to nature, you can consider joining some local eagle tours on the weekend. And today we have invited Samson So on our program to tell us more about birdwatching and eagle tourism. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. So Samson, to begin with, can you tell us how you came to take up birdwatching in the first place? Well, I started to pay attention uh, on birds since my university days. I studied ecology in Hong Kong, and I, I got a chance to be trained as a nature guide in the Maipo Nature Reserve some years ago. Um, it was very lucky because I can learn about birds, and I can learn about nature, and eventually I became a very keen bird watcher. And I even carried my own binoculars when I go to school. Um, I can enjoy bird watching in between classes, and uh, sometimes I would search sitting in the, the, the school campus, enjoying the bird song and seeing them dancing. Um, and realize that birds are very, very much like human beings because we all enjoy dancing and we also enjoy music. Mm, so it's really part of your daily life too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear. I mean, it's always good to turn your passion into your occupation. Yes, I'm very lucky. Exactly. And I understand that you currently teach nature photography and um, environmental courses, right? So could you please tell us what are the subjects of your photos and are they limited to birds? Well, as an ecologist, I uh, take pictures not only on birds. I take pictures of uh, birds' food, such as insects, and their surroundings, such as the, the trees and also the environment. So I became more ambitious uh, after I got my uh, pictures published. Nowadays, I teach uh, photography and I teach um, ecology to students, not only limited to photographers, but I also do a lot of communi community services. Um, I try to um, um, let more people to know about nature, to treasure, and admire what nature offers us. So from what you mentioned, it sounds like in addition to animals, um, nature photography also encompasses plants and natural landscapes. So where are some of your favorite spots to take photos in Hong Kong? Well, it's a very good question because 
Um, I do have some favorite sports, but in Hong Kong, there are many, uh, at least well, 24 country parks. Uh, we have Geo Park and also some marine parks. It's difficult to pick just one uh, particular uh, sports. And some of the urban parks were my favorite sports because I have to uh, visit those parks on a regular basis. And now, uh, because I live in rural area in Hong Kong, and it's easy for me to do bird watching just right behind um, the small woodland behind my house. So so uh, I think uh, the particular sports, um, everyone can enjoy bird watching at their own uh, favorite sports. So I guess, you know, just to follow up with a lot of people who love to take photos, obviously it's much more different to actually like shoot the animals or the insects because they move really fast. So any tips on photography equipment <laughs> that we should bring with us? Well, you said, uh, many people have, uh, have the impression that nature photographers, uh, usually they would dread along heavy lenses, heavy equipments, but actually this is not the case. Because uh, sometimes I, I think the most important equipment um, is your eyes. So um, to do observation first, get to know your subjects before you take pictures. You can use whatever you like. And these days, even you can use your cell phone to take uh, decent pictures. So don't worry about the equipment. Uh, focus on your subject and do enjoy process instead of the result. I learn much about nature when I'm focusing on one subject. And in the process, I, I I started to learn how to admire, how to treasure and cherish nature. And without nature, there would be no human beings. So I want to tell stories about our nature surroundings, um, the nature stories about them. So my works are uh, being trained as an ecologist. I don't want to show pictures of uh, just, just an art, a piece of artwork. I want to tell stories with my pictures and try to arouse people's interest and also their um, the sense of belongings uh, for uh, the audiences. Mm, that's very well said. Now I understand that your children also go bird watching with you and they even take their own pictures. So how do you think bird watching could be beneficial to children? Well, it, because nature is the best classroom in my in my opinion. So uh, on a daily basis we we do but uh, we do watching birds or other wildlife in a subconscious uh, basis. We don't go birding. We are doing uh, our own observation no matter whether we are we are waiting for a school bus or on the way home so uh, watching nature is not uh, a special uh, activity for us it's just a, a way of life that's a that's actually a really good like advice because you know most of us are at work are very hectic you go everywhere and you always miss out on all the little things all the beautiful things around you yeah and i think it's really great that you're starting your kids young um you know it's about learning to be the cohabitants with nature and not just you know taking up a, a role of an artist or a photographer and i guess doing something that the whole family enjoys is definitely you know a great way to bond so can you share any unforgettable moments or anecdotes with us? Well, uh, during the COVID lockdown uh, years, uh, my kids couldn't go to school and we stayed, we stayed all the time at home. And I, we were lucky because we live in a uh, rural countryside. So we, we have uh, the whole piece of woodland right behind our, our, our house. And I remember one day we discovered a family of owls um, living in a tree just right at our doorstep. So we started to observe the family. That caught the attention of our neighbors. So they were all very curious about what we were doing, what we've been observing so for, uh, for so long. And we shared the story of the owls and all of a sudden all neighbors, all parents and <laughs> kids, they all became the owl watchers. And I remember that we, we often wait until the owl emerge before we start our dinner. So that became a, a, a daily ritual for, for, the, for the neighbors and for our family. And it was very important because before that, um, our neighbors, uh, they, were, they were like strangers. But after we became bird watchers, um, the birds brought us together. And now we became very good friends. We thought that um, birds are not only birds, they are our neighbors. So we have new neighbors joining us. Wow, it's like community bonding, right? And I guess one lesson we can take away from this story is to pick the right house. Have a backyard For and sure. have birds in our backyard. <laughs> yes, we would love to have you as a neighbor because you would also be able to like teach us a lot of things as well. So we can actually bond over these activities. So apart from taking your kids to bird watch around Hong Kong on the weekend. I understand you also travel to different places around the world with them during the holidays. So now I'm curious to know how your family vacations are differ from the typical ones that we're familiar with. Well, um, like all parents, we all, we all want our kids to learn something during overseas trips. 
because I'm an ecologist, so it's easy for us to pick our location. So national parks and rural, rural areas are our first choices. I think the difference is um, we, uh, during the, our trip, we uh, spend most of the time outdoor. We spend most of the time looking, waiting, and searching for animals. So, and, and that is not like something that you, you do every day. And it's not like going to um, a famous monument that you, there's, it's always there. And so we can take pictures uh, with, uh, with, the, the, with your selfie or something. But uh, watching wildlife is more like a, a game, a game that, uh, that we need patience. And we also, we need to pay attention. And I think that's very important for the kids to learn. Yeah, and I think sometimes I would actually feel lucky if I'm able to spot some special wildlife or these kind of memories. It's a great way to teach people not to take things for granted, right? And pay attention to details. Do you think your kids have more patience, you know, in general? When they handle yeah. life, you know? Kids sometimes have like a short attention span. But do you think it's a great training for them? Well, uh, it's very interesting because um, when, when they are doing homework, they are not that patient. But when they are out there, they are watching or waiting for something to happen. Um, they, they pay more attention about the surrounding, what's going on about the, what the bird is doing and what maybe th there will be a lion hiding somewhere. And I think that is a good training for, for, for kids because uh, I know kids, they usually they have a short attention time. But um, nature has offered a lot of uh, changes. Mm. Sometimes you can be the sunny day in the morning and maybe it's a rainy day in the afternoon. So uh, they learn that uh, not to take everything for granted. Mm. So uh, there are challenges out there mm. and it's important to bring the kids out uh, from their comfort zone and to really explore what's going on out there. Right, curiosity and gratitude. Well, I'd also like to know about your eco tours because you've been to so many different ones. Um, can you share about your most memorable eco tour? Very difficult question to answer because there were so many places that I uh, that I love to visit again and again. But um, this year, in 2023. Um, we had a very memorable safari in August with my family and my elder son, uh, he was 14 and he was sitting in a jeep with uh, the little brother, he was uh, six years old and we depart really early in the morning from the camp and we went to the mighty uh, Mara River waiting for the, the great migration and not long before we stopped and parked our, uh, our vehicles and one wildebeest started to cross the river. He was he or she was very brave because it's uh, not a familiar environment for for the animal. So after the first animal uh, started to cross the river, the other follows. They came in their thousand, and it took them it, it took the whole herd almost an hour to finish crossing the river. And at the beginning, we took pictures, and after maybe a while, we took enough pictures. We do have uh, uh, good pictures and good uh, video shots. But it's the, the moment that we share together that was most precious because now we have stories to share. We have the same experience and we have a good memory then that will uh, accompany us for, 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 for years to come. We've learned about your favorite spots. We know um, your most memorable trip. So where is your next destination? Um, I'm planning uh, more African safari uh, for next year. I will go to um, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, uh, Kenya, and Tanzania. Just want to say I've been to Tanzania years ago, and we did try to go to the national park, but we only marked schedule for like two hours or so. And at the end of the day, we didn't really see anything. So then well-planned itinerary is very important and also to know what you're trying to look for and plan accordingly. Thank you yes. so much for all your tips. And speaking of, today is the winter solstice, a time for a family reunion for the Chinese. In ancient times, it was observed by farmers as a year-end celebration after the autumn harvest. It's a Chinese custom to gather the family around the table for a sumptuous dinner on this special day. And we hope that you're also celebrating this festive occasion with your loved ones. Now on that note, it's time for us to head home for some glutinous rice ball. Thank you for tuning in. See you next time. Good night! Good night. Oh,